So our garden is uh, relatively large. We have uh, 10,000 square feet and everything we produce is given away to two food pantries and to our wonderful garden volunteers. And in uh, this last year, uh, 2020, we gave away two and one half tons of fresh organic produce. Uh, our theme for the garden is uh, building community through gardening. And uh, we have some individuals that drive 35, 40 minutes to be able to come and help in the garden. So our, our regular volunteer sessions, uh, we get together every Tuesday evening. And that's from, uh, from about five o'clock until 745. And so it's any time during that time period. People have the flexibility to come when they want and leave when they need to. And we will probably start those regular sessions around mid-April, around uh, April 13th. So new volunteers are welcome. And it is a wonderful way for you to come and help in the garden. Number one, you're providing food to families that are in need of food because they receive the food through the food pantries. But it also is really a nice way for you to have hands-on learning and be able to apply some of the things that uh, Joe Allen's gonna be talking about in tonight's class. We do have master gardeners that are part of our volunteers. And so it's an easy way for you to be able to ask questions and just really learn a lot. So uh, we do continue to follow our COVID-19 uh, uh, safety guidelines. We do wear masks and, uh, and, 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 and last year it really worked out well, even in a pandemic year with uh, being able to, to keep all of our volunteers safe. So for more information, uh, I'll be putting in the chat the contact information for myself and Craig Youngman, who is also uh, a co-coordinator with me. And so uh, we will put our names and telephone numbers. And so if you have any questions, you are welcome to call us at any time. Linda, back to you. And you're still I, muted. I muted myself, yes. Yes, okay. you did. Sorry. <laughs> Bethany Community Gardens is entering its fourth year of offering gardening classes in the community. This year is virtual, of course, but we still hope to build community through our classes and gardening. Today is our first class, the Garden Boot Camp. We will hold three additional classes. April 6th is going to be Veggies 101 and 102. April 20th will be Grow Up and we'll be talking about different structures in the garden. And May 4th will be Pollinators in the Landscape. We're very excited to partner with a professional gardening educator this year. I'd like to introduce Joellen Myers Sharp. She is the Hoosier Gardener. She's a 25 year award winning veteran of print journalism and owns Write For You LLC, a freelance writing and editing business. You can find her blog at HoosierGardener.com. Joellen is the president of GardenCom, Garden Communicators International and Indiana Advanced Master Gardener. She co-teaches the City Gardener program with the Purdue Marion County Horticulture Extension Educator. She is a garden coach and has all season container planting business. For nearly 20 years, she has worked at a large independent garden center in Indianapolis, including a stint as buyer of perennials, trees and shrubs. I know you're really going to enjoy this program. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will stop at intervals and answer questions. And Jenny and I will monitor the chat box. Now I turn it over to Joellen. Thank you for coming everybody. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here and we'll start with the, the program. Uh, like we said, if you have any questions, stick them in the chat and we'll get to them. On the handout, you have my email and uh, you can always send me questions through the email. I've also provided a link to uh, my free monthly newsletter in the handout, so there's that. Um, I have to say last year was an incredible year for someone like me and I'm sure someone like Linda and Jenny, where there were just so many people interested in gardening. 
you know, and I'm sure it was just because everyone was home and they didn't really have anything else to do. And so they all decided they needed to be a gardener or a vegetable gardener. And uh, I, I'm amazed at uh, how much people know and how much people don't know. So I'm hoping in tonight's program, we uh, can give you some good solid information to grow on. So these are the topics we'll cover, plant biology, where we should put the garden, what plants we should use, uh, soil, water, and mulch, pest and disease control, safety tips, harvest uses, and resources. If you didn't get the handout, I'm sure Linda will forward the handout to you, but there are a lot of resources listed in that handout. Uh, what is a plant? It's alive. At the garden center, I hear all the time, I want a plant that's low maintenance. Do I have to water it? Do I have to fertilize it? Does it need light? Yes, it's alive. It's a live thing. And so uh, we just need to remember that. And people, you know, like people, plants have certain needs when they're alive. But what, unlike us, plants make their own food. They use um, the sun uh, called in photosynthesis. So they take in sunlight and moisture and then they expel um, oxygen which keeps our air clean and so those things are the most important things when it comes to growing plants these are just a sample of the plant parts we eat um, you know you may not always recognize that a tomato is a fruit or a cucumber is a fruit but it is a fruit and we know about lettuces uh, because you know any leaf uh, items like your a lot of your herbs and things like that we eat the leaves of those we eat the broccoli stalks we for a bulb we eat the onions or garlic and so those are kinds of the the plant parts that that we all eat so before we really get started into the nitty-gritty there are some considerations that uh, people should keep in mind one of them is who's going to be doing the work um, and then what do you and your family like to eat? You know, if you've got a, a seed packet of spinach and you don't like spinach, don't plant the spinach. Plant what your family is going to eat or what it wants to eat. And also think about how you want to use the food that you grow in your garden because it'll make a difference if you want to preserve it, maybe the kinds of plants that you might plant. And then the last thing is how much space is available. So when we look at plant growth, we're looking at light, temperature, humidity, water, and plant nutrition. Uh, but when we're planning the garden, it's kind of like just good real estate, which is location, location, location. And you want a place that, where you can actually have the space that you need to grow your plants. You want, an area that is in full sun, and that would be a minimum of six hours of direct sun. And that means that it's direct sun. It doesn't mean it's filtering through trees. It doesn't mean that it's you know, coming over the neighbor's fence. It means direct sun. And then you also want uh, an area that has decent soil or you can turn into making decent soil. You want it to be close to a water, if, especially if you have to lug water to uh, water the garden or you have to string a hose, you know, how much hose do you have to water everything. And then you also want it to be where you can get to it if you want to. If you put your garden out on the back 40, for instance, you know, you may never walk back there to, to harvest what you've got or pick your fruits. And um, there's always so much enthusiasm among beginning gardeners and the it's hard to think about this but you really need to start small if it's it just becomes too big it's overwhelming and you won't feel good about what you're doing the weeds are going to take over and it'll just be more and more of um, work as opposed to the pleasure of actually growing your own food a 10 by 10 square foot garden would work pretty well for, I'd say, a family of four. I have a very small yard, and so my uh, garden, where I actually grow my vegetables, is roughly about four by four. When you're thinking about your garden, um, you want to be able to reach in from 
uh, the like the ground into the garden. So you want it to be about a hand or an arm length. You don't want it to be any wider than that necessarily because you don't want to have to step in the garden in order to pick your fruit or water or pick off any bugs. So it's always kind of nice to sketch out a garden. Um, you can use coins to kind of signify what plant you're looking at. You can determine the size of the plant. You can also um, figure out how much space you're going to need in your garden in order to grow the plants that you want to grow because the seed packets or the plant tags will tell you what the size of the plant is. And then you get to decide what, what style of garden you want. Do you want a raised bed? Do you want one that's directly in the ground? Do you want square foot gardening, which is extremely popular right now? And there's a lot <clears throat> online about how to do that. Or if you're like me and you don't always have great space in the sun, but you've got sun spots, you can grow food in containers. And so I'm just going to show you a few examples of what raised beds can look like. Um, if you don't have tools, you can buy what they call brackets or corners, and you can uh, affix your uh, raised bed corners with these brackets or on the one on the right, they kind of sink down into the, the one below it. Um, here are more corners that you can buy uh, online and you can see on the right how they're used. Um, but, and then, you know, you can also use deck screws if you, you know, want to uh, screw the pieces of wood together. And there are raised beds. This one is an enclosed raised bed and it's even got some chicken wire on the left side. You can see that uh, and that's where they're growing some vining plants. It looks like peas are growing there. Uh, these are raised beds raised, which I think are really cool. The older we get, the more we don't want to bend over and get on our knees. And so uh, the, getting these raised beds like this um, really can help, especially uh, you know, if they can be designed to work for uh, people who need wheelchair accessibility or something like that. Uh, here we have another framed raised bed. And these are real popular too, the troughs. Um, this was on a garden tour last year. This was in Meridian Kessler, this trough was. And you can see there, you can see at least three troughs in this garden. And uh, they're really pretty nice because they're, they're sort of permanent, uh, but you can grow in it what you want. And this is a, when you say a raised bed garden, everyone always thinks that it's a framed bed. It doesn't have to be a framed bed. So this is an unframed raised bed and it can be an in-ground garden. So you can see like the straw in the pathways and then the, where the vegetables are growing, that's slightly elevated from the pathway. And it's usually smooth on the flat. That's what, um, at the top flat, that's what you plant in. And um, it's just an easy way to have a raised bed without actually having to have it be framed. This is an example of the raised bed, of the yeah, raised bed in a square foot garden, which you can do in the ground or you can do in a raised bed. And uh, this is also an example of showing flowers with the vegetables. And the reason that we wanna have flowers near our vegetables is because the flowers bring in pollinators and a lot of the food we grow need to be pollinated. So we're making it really easy for the pollinators to do their job when we have flowers there. Here we have some herbs and some um, sweet 100 tomatoes in containers. Here we have there, the uh, plant breeders hear us when we tell them that we need plants that don't get, you know, eight feet tall. And so they've bred some, these are hanging baskets and these are tomatoes that are bred to be in a hanging basket. And then here we have containers. These are smart pots. They're made uh, out of recycled plastic. And um, I grow all of my tomatoes in smart pots. I've also grown, um, potatoes is what I grow in smart pots. And I've also grown, uh, some of the smaller container peppers in smart pots. It's hard to grow tomatoes in smart pots because sometimes they need to be 
um, you know, braced in some way. And it's always a little difficult to try to figure out how to do that with a, a smart pot. I've tried and I haven't been able to do that. And so this is kind of the best part is picking out the plants that we want to grow. And so we need to look at the size of the plant. This would be the mature size of the plant. And usually the seed packet or the plant tag tells us what that size is. We always want to look for plants that have disease resistance. And so if you look at your plant tags or your um, seed packets for tomatoes, it'll tell you if it's resistant to um, Fusarium wilt, for instance. It'll have an F or an N or something like that on there that tells you that it's disease resistant. And some plants are insect resistant. You know, they've been bred to be insect resistant. And so we, if you're worried about that, that's one of the other things that you want to, you know, take a look at. The soil requirements, we need, you know, halfway decent soil. Loamy soil is what we're all really striving for, and it may take a long time to get there, but that's, that's sort of what we're looking for. And then also habitat. So for instance, you could grow lettuces, a lot of greens in more shade than you would want to grow a tomato. So if you've got a lot of greens that you're growing, lettuces, spinach, things like that, um, you can grow those in more shade than uh, you could some of your sun-loving plants. So if you've got a bed that's partly in shade, that would be where you would put your lettuces and things like that and save the really sunny spots for the plants that need those. So when we talk about plant selection with tomatoes, there are two types of tomatoes. Those are the determinate kind and indeterminate. Determinates are, they sort of get to a certain size and they produce all their fruit and then they're kind of done. I mean, they may continue to you know, produce some fruit after that, but the idea is that they grow, produce their fruit, their fruit and then they're done. So if you're interested in preserving your food, you want, that's more what you're interested in because you don't wanna be picking three tomatoes once a week, saving all those tomatoes to preserve. It'd be better to have everything come on so that you can have your day of canning tomatoes or freezing tomatoes or your peppers or whatever. Indeterminate tomatoes will grow until they're killed by the frost. They tend to produce all season, but not all at once. And in indeterminate tomatoes, and with a, really a lot of the vegetables that we grow, the more we harvest them, the more they're going to produce. So, you know, don't hold off on that uh, good experience of picking your fresh ripe tomatoes and eating them because it'll help the plant produce more. And then there are some planting methods and techniques, succession planting, interplanting, spacing and season extension. So this is an example of succession planting. So if you plant peas, you know, about this time of year, they're a cool season crop. And so we grow the peas, we harvest the peas. And when they're done producing, we pull those out and we plant green beans and lettuces. We harvest the, you know, that it also is a cool weather. Uh, plant and so you can pull the lettuces and and you know and replace those with cucumbers and you can see that you can uh, once you've you know the season is done for that you can plant a later blooming or a later uh, producing plant so this is an example of interplanting this is the traditional three sisters so you can see the corn stalk and then if you see the little heart-shaped flowers that are kind of twining up the um, corn stalk, those are beans. And then the larger leafed, uh, darker green leaves at the bottom, those are a squash. So those, that's the traditional three sisters planting. It goes way back in time. It's, it's you know, that, inter, that kind of interplanting has been around forever. Um, here we are, have spacing. So we're looking at a seed packet. And you can see it tells you how much room to leave uh, for the plant. And then up at the top there, it tells us it's a determinant. This is a tomato. So it tells us that it's a determinant tomato, how much space it needs, how many days to germination, the quarter inch that we need to uh, plant the seed depth. 
And so it just gives you a really a whole lot of instructions and uh, where to plant it and what to expect. Here we have an example again for spacing, which is the square foot gardening. Each um, square foot has a certain plant in it. So the larger ones with just one plant, those are probably tomatoes and peppers or squash. And then the smaller areas where you have, you know, lots of different um, sizes, some have four, some have nine. Those are the, the smaller plants that you, that you might be growing. Here we have season extenders, wall of water, which I've actually used before there. You can buy these and you put them in the garden and you uh, fill them up with water. And then the plant grows inside that. It's, they're, they're just a hollow uh, piece of plastic with uh, like ribs in it that you put the water in. And I've done this, I started an, a tomato in April, which is, we all know, is really early to try to grow tomatoes, but I did it in a wall of water. And I have to tell you that the tomato did great and the stock on the tomato was very, very thick. I mean, I was surprised at how, how thick the stock was on the tomato. But that's one way you can ex um, extend the season. And this works in either um, spring or fall. Here is an, another example of a season extender, and this one doubles as a bug keeper outer. Um, if you grow squash, you might be have a pest like squash bugs or something like that. And if you put this on after you plant your squash, it goes a long way to keeping out uh, undesirable insects who aren't going to pollinate your plants and who are just going to like ruin the plant. So that's one thing that you can do. Here we have more of a hoop house. It's a little bit of a thicker uh, covering and you can start your plants um, in a hoop house like this. You know, start your seedlings and keep them outside like that and then eventually move them into the garden. And these are little cloches which um, uh, cover plants, individual plants. Here we've got um, plastic bottles so if you've got like milk jugs or something like that you cut the bottom out of the milk jug you put the milk jug over the plant you know put a stick in there to keep the milk jug in place and then that protects the plant from freezing or you know cold temperatures uh, and these again can be used in spring and fall here's an example and my dog is inspecting it i think she approves this was an example of a late freeze coming on in spring and the hostas were up and I was trying to show folks how they could protect their hostas, which is just inverting a nursery pot over the plants that you're trying to protect from the frost. And again, you put a stick in there just to hold it in place. Here's an example again of how we can use uh, pop bottles or milk jugs to protect plants that are in containers. And then uh, I've done this before too, um, at the end of the season or when things are getting started, you can throw a bed sheet over your plants to protect them. That uh, can work like overnight, but this is not the way to protect your plants. Uh, covering them in plastic, uh, if it's cold say in spring and you're starting your garden and you've got some plants up and all of a sudden we're gonna have a hard freeze, you can use plastic as long as it's tented and not touching the plants. But if it's touching the plants, uh, wherever it touches the plants, that part of the plant is likely gonna freeze or be affected by the freezing temperatures. So you wanna be careful about that. So here we are preparing the bed. Should we look at some questions maybe? Jenny, are there any questions? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat just yet. If anyone has any, you can drop those in the chat and we'll read those to uh, Joellen as, um, if you want. Okie doke. So now we're gonna look at preparing the bed. Um, so, you know, we have soil that's too wet, isn't she cute? You know, and so she's got a mud ball. If your soil does that, it's too wet. 
if your soil crumbles when you make a fist with it and it kind of crumbles and falls apart, that's the soil is just right. And really you're wanting the consistency of not too dry, not too wet. Like if you wring out a washcloth, you know, how that, that feels, that sort of moistness that you still have in there, but it's not dripping wet and it's not dry. So actually the very first garden I did, I did a double dig. And what this illustrates is the space on the left is what you dig first. And you dig the soil out of that section and you move the soil all the way over to, in this case, the right. You can see it there. And then the second space, you dig from that second space and you move it to the first space. And in the third space, you move it to the second space, like that. And then the last space is where you move the soil from the first space to the last space. And the idea of double digging is that it, you know, it gets down about 10 to 12 inches or so in the soil. And it's a way that, you know, once you have the bare, uh, once you've removed the soil from the area that you've just dug, it's a great place to put you know, compost or some rotted manures or other kinds of organic matter in that way. And again, when you move the soil over there, you can top it off with that too. I will say this is laborious to do that. And my uh, favorite way to do it is to bring in planters mix, which you just bring in, uh, dump it on the bed and plant in it. You don't really even have to churn it in or anything. And to me, that's the way to go. And there are several, um, organization companies that provide planters mix. Um, actually, my favorite one is Mark's Mix from Indiana Mulch. I use it in my garden and we use it to plant in the containers downtown. So it's a very good product. And if you're gonna be using this at home, I'd suggest that you get your order in because last spring, we couldn't find planters mix anywhere uh, because everyone was really interested in gardening and they were ordering it and it's um, it's a mix of compost usually and some soil and it's just a really nice rich uh, uh, soil to plant in. It's really the top six to eight inches of soil where plants do most of their feeding. If you think about the root depths on plants, they're not gonna be very deep. And there are, you know, the three most important uh, nutrients is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And if you're looking for a fertilizer, you're looking for those three numbers on there, although, some of the newer uh, fertilizers don't have phosphorus in it because of um, water contamination. And you don't really, Indiana has pretty good phosphorus in its soil. And so these might come into play after you have a soil test done, or if you have a soil test done and the soil test will come back and tell you that you need, you know, some of this or some of that, that there's, you know, too much of this. And also trace elements, um, which are really hard to find in the soil, but they're, they're elements that the plants take in. Uh, so for instance, if we think of spinach being a high, uh, a plant that has high iron content, that's you know one of the ways that um, the plants can use that. And so, you know, the soil structure is probably the most important thing in your garden, your soil, if you don't have, decent soil bed, then your plants are gonna struggle. And you shouldn't be concerned if it takes you a couple, three years to build your bed so that it has really good soil structure. And so here we see that age is a factor, organic matter. Roots are a factor because they, uh, as they grow down into the soil, they kind of loosen the soil and allow oxygen and water and other things to penetrate down there. And then, um, the other thing are microorganisms, which we don't really see. And I've got insects on here because people always get wigged out about insects and, and ants especially. And ants are great little, um, you know, they help break up the soil. So ants are not necessarily a bad thing, but they definitely aerate the soil. What destroys the soil? We looked at that earlier, you know, digging when wet. 
compacting the soil, <coughs> excuse me, which is by walking on it. Once you've got your beds prepared, you don't want to walk on it because it compacts the soil. And if the soil is compacted, then that means that the roots have to try really hard to break through and get down on the ground. Also, um, we want, you don't want really rain to fall on bare soil. Um, the reason that's a problem is because it uh, may not be absorbed uh, by the soil and it just runs off. And so it's really a waste of the valuable resource that we have of rainwater. How to improve the soil? We add organic matter, you get your soil tested. And if the, your soil test come back, comes back and tells you you have a high pH or a low pH, it would probably be a high pH here because Indiana soil is really pretty alkaline. Our water is alkaline. And so that's something you kind of wanna pay attention to. So for instance, potatoes like a little bit more acidic soil to grow in. And uh, that's one of the things I do is I use an acidic fertilizer on the, in the soil pack when I'm growing tomatoes because they like it with a little bit lower pH. And you can do, uh, take a soil test. This is a professional way to do it. I've given you some resources from Purdue that tells you how to do this. And also it tells you where you can send your soil test. Uh, we only have one place in Indiana that tests um, soil as far as I know, and that's in Fort Wayne. And uh, if you go there, it gives you also some instructions. In the garden centers and the big box stores, you'll see the test kits. Um, you know, these are sort of quick and dirty uh, and their uh, accuracy is always questioned. I mean, we don't always know. And um, if I were gonna make a suggestion, I would say not to use these, that I think you're better off getting a professional soil test where they can actually run everything they need and tell you exactly what's in your soil. So when we're talking about improving the soil, we wanna talk about organic matter. Here we have a cow dropping us some organic matter. And cows are really cool because they have four stomachs. And uh, the organic matter that they deposit doesn't have very many weed seeds in it. Uh, horse manure, that is not well composted and aged may have a lot of weed seeds in it. And so I would urge caution in using horse manure in your garden that's not well aged and composted. And we usually think about adding organic matter. You can do it in the spring, but also in the fall. The fall is really a good time to add that in you know, either organic matter or, you know, chopped leaves, uh, some different kinds of compost. Uh, all of that can be added in uh, spring or fall, but you definitely want to layer it in in the fall so that you can have your bed continue to pick up the nutrients that it needs from the organic matter we're putting in. Ah, the best part plant selections. Do you want to take some uh, questions? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, the first person says, I'm struggling to understand where in the yard to place the garden because of neighbors, huge trees, their shed, shadows. Also, I have no idea if the rows should be horizontal, horizontal or vertical. Usually, um, you try to go, you, you try to have your garden be east to west. Uh, so um, it has a full southern exposure that way. So if your beds are running east to west, that gives you a full sun exposure, uh, you know, for the um, south side, especially on the south side. Um, if you've got really a lot of shade, I'd say if you can go with containers, that might be the way to go so that you have sunspots or areas that have sun that you can plant in that. Um, and you just really have to look at the space, you know, kind of monitor it all day and figure out exactly how, about how much sun is gonna fall on the space where you wanna plant. 
And like we said, we want plants, uh, you know, you want about six hours of direct sun. And um, I don't know if that answered the question. I hope it did. And the next, the next question is uh, recommendations for seed starting soil. Well, I know that there are products out there for seed starting. And if you want to use them, you can. Usually they're sterile, which is good. Um, sometimes the growers will have seed starting medium. Uh, but, you know, it, it's not critical. If you get a really good potting mix, and I mean a good potting mix, not potting soil, uh, but a potting mix and start your plants in that, um, you know, either in four inch pots or, you know, trays or however you want to do it. That's what I do. I don't do a lot uh, with um, seed starting medium, but, but it's out there and you can use it if you want to, um, but it's, it's not necessary unless Jenny wants to override that. <laughs> Okay, the next question is, what do you think is better for a beginner, a raised bed or planting in the ground? Well, you can still have a raised bed and plant in the ground like I showed you, you know, where you've got, um, you know, personally, I like raised beds because you can usually plant a little bit earlier. They warm up a little bit earlier than um, a, an in-ground garden. And like I showed you in that one picture, um, you're planting in the ground, but the ground is raised maybe about eight or 10 inches from the pathway and it's flattened off and that's, and that's what you plant in. Uh, but, um, I, but I grow in raised beds, so um, I don't plant just straight in the ground. Okay. Except unless it's just an, you know, an unframed raised bed. Uh, the next question is, what would be an amendment to loosen your soil if it does not crumble, or would you just suggest the Marks mix? Well, if it's real clay, if it's a whole lot of clay soil, then, you know, the cure for that is compost. Really the com compost is the cure for about any soil issue you have. It helps if your soil is sandy, you know, it gives it some meat in there to hold everything together. If your soil is really clay, like hard clay, and uh, the compost helps break that up and make it uh, a little bit looser over time, over a few years. Um, but if you've got crummy soil, bring in the planters mix. I mean, it really makes things very easy to do it that way. And if you measure the size of your bed and, and uh, call the landscape supply company and give them the measurements of your bed, they'll tell you how much you need, how much uh, square, square yard or yards you need for, the, for your soil. Okay, the next question is, what do you think of planting in grow bags, which I think you might have shown a little bit? Well, yeah, those are smart. Uh, I've done grow bags. I, I grew potatoes in grow bags and I didn't have a good success with those um, because they're plastic. Uh, the ones I showed are actually a cloth and uh, they are, um, I don't have a dog in this hunt as far as smart pots go. I've just grown so much food in them and I, you know, they're just really great for that. Um, they uh, have, the way they're made, they encourage good root development. You know, they don't really dry out as, as quickly as maybe some other pots that you use. Um, but, you know, you can try it. There are hardly any sure things in gardening and you know, what you do is you try it and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, next year you do something else because gardeners always know next year will be better. Okay, we got three more questions. One says, uh, should I be turning my soil tilling before I start planting or use aeration from previous plants, insects, and worms? Well, um, I'm not a big fan of churning up the soil, uh, tilling it uh, very deeply because under that top layer of soil are years and years of seed banks. 
weed seed banks. And uh, sometimes when you till the soil and you bring all that up to the surface, you've exposed these weed seeds to light and moisture, and that's what you're gonna have. Um, I think uh, lightly loosening the soil and uh, you know working in some compost and things like that is always good. But I'm not a big advocate of you know big tilling. But I don't have a farm. And uh, Jenny, do you want to talk about that at all? If um, about tilling, because you have a pretty big garden, and I'm guessing you probably rototill yours. Yeah, but I rototill very shallow. Okay. Um, and as the years have gone by, I plant cover crops. Yeah. Um, cover crops are great to to have along with the compost. With those two things, it really helps. But if if you're just starting a garden and you have not had one there before it's fine to till down three or four inches, but, and make sure you work something into the soil that's some form of compost. Yeah. Okay, the next question is, is it time to plant cold weather crops and then what type of wood um, should we use for elevated gardens as in untreated wood? Yeah, untreated wood, that's what you're looking for. Cedar is a good one. Um, you know, they also have, um, you can buy w wood, it's not really wood, but it's, you know, plastic, and uh, those last a long time. Uh, you know, it's, they look kind of like boards. You can see, you know, sometimes you'll see decks made out of the material, and those work actually pretty well also. But you want, uh, you know, just, I wouldn't do pine because it's not really a very hard wood, it's a soft wood. But if you can get cedar or something like that, that would be what I, that's what I've always used to build my beds. And as far as cool season goes, um, you could start doing some of your cool season plants. I, in the handout, there's a link to Produce a vegetable garden planting calendar, which breaks down all of the plants that you might like to grow, and it gives you time frames on when you can start planting those. So, in the probably in the next week or so, I'm going to start sowing lettuce. Um, you know, St. Patrick's Day is sort of a day where you can start your uh, cool season crops, uh, and so yeah, I'd say about any time you could start. Okay, we're done on questions for now. Okay, so on the screen, we have just uh, some of the cool season veggies. Uh, and, um, you know, these are the ones that you can set out early, like about this time, you know, the late March, early April is a good time to start those. And then warm season veggies are about anything else we grow. And this is just a list of some of those um, that we grow. Uh, for warm season and um, and then there are some that can grow in either warm or cool temperatures. So for instance, I grow uh, carrots. Um, I grow a short little fat carrot and I grow those in the uh, smart pots uh, because you know if you look at carrots, you know we're eating the root of the, of the carrot. And so if we look at like the normal kinds of carrots, you know, which have long slender roots, the soil has to be pretty good for that to grow and develop all the way down in there. And so if you've got a uh, soil that's kind of hard and really clay and not, you know, maybe it would just be really hard for that carrot to make its way down into the ground. There are short fat ones that you can grow, which taste like carrots and work just fine. So should you do seeds or transplants? And so on the left-hand side, that's under seeds. And on the right-hand side, it has transplants. And I say this um, because these, if you plant a tomato, if you buy a tomato transplant at the garden center and plant that, it's, you know, it's likely gonna grow. It's hard to do seed starting indoors. Uh, which is what you would do for tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. If you wanted to start those seeds indoors, you can certainly do that. Usually you do it about six to eight weeks before it would be time to plant them outside. 
But to me, uh, it's a challenge because of the lighting, they need a lot of light. Uh, a lot of times you might need to run a little bit of a fan to keep um, them moving to help strengthen the plants. Um, if you don't have enough light and you're trying to grow, start these uh, seeds indoors, um, they'll stretch or they'll get um, a fungus disease and just dampen off and croak. So I say for beginners, the ones on the right are easy to direct sow right in the garden. And the ones, I mean, on the left, and then the ones on the right for beginners, I would say start with plants. And if you have a small yard there, again, like I said, the breeders are hearing us. And so they are uh, breeding plants that are compact or dwarf. We have a couple of dwarf uh, peppers here, a couple of compact or dwarf tomatoes. And so what you can do is if you go to like allamericaselections.org and look at their selections, they, you can kind of get an idea if they're compact or dwarf or what kind of plant they are. And also if you have a chance to visit the uh, display garden at the fairgrounds, the Master Gardeners and Purdue Extension have a pretty large garden there where they grow a lot of the All-American Selection plants which have grown all over the country and they've been judged to be, you know, better than maybe what's on the market. Here's even a, a dwarf um, eggplant. So is it heirlooms or hybrids? Um, the easiest way to control disease is usually with hybrids because they're bred to be disease resistant. Uh, and seed that comes from a hybrid, uh, if you save that seed and sow it the next year, it may not come true to the plant that you thought you were saving the seed for because hybrids can be a cross of, you know, one or more plants to get the hybrid that, that you planted. Where heirlooms um, really, I mean, I love heirloom tomatoes and that's primarily what I grow, but fortunately um, I can buy heirloom tomatoes at most garden centers. But a lot of uh, really avid gardeners love to grow heirlooms and the selection among heirlooms is really uh, much different than what we find in, in say some of our normal plants and heirlooms can be flowers or foods. So it kind of just depends on what you're interested in. I will tell you that a lot of heirlooms will not have the disease and insect resistance that the hybrids will have. Also the heirlooms might produce a little bit later. And the hybrids, also the foliage is maybe looks a lot different than what you think it should look like. So um, it doesn't hurt to try a few heirlooms. Like I say, I grow heirloom tomatoes every year. So, um, you know, it's just something to consider. And heirlooms are what they call open pollinated, which means, um, you know, they're pollinated by air and so are insects. And so it, you know, they're just really, I think they're pretty easy to grow except for the, you know, the likelihood that there may be a lack of disease resistance in them. So here are four tips for success. You wanna plant at the right time, the depth and the distance or the spacing. And what the planting time is depends on our zone or what kind of climate we have. And that's where that Purdue vegetable planting calendar can be really helpful. If you're buying seeds, you wanna make sure you get disease-free seeds. Uh, I will tell you some seeds are treated with a fungicide because um, they are very susceptible to getting fungus diseases. And if you're concerned about that, the seed packet should tell you if it's um, treated with a fungicide. And then, like we talked earlier, some vegetables just do better if they're transplants instead of seeds um, because the plant's already growing and all you have to do is like plant it, you know, you don't have to worry about all the light it's going to get and germination. Watering uh, and rain gauge. I think it's good to have a rain gauge in your garden. It just kind of gives you an idea of how much rain you're getting. And 
roughly, you know, you, we hear all the time that, you know, plants need roughly an inch of water a week to survive. Well, what's an inch of water? You know, I don't know. That's where the rain gauge is helpful for that. Um, watering drip irrigation is probably the most um, sustainable way to grow your plants because the little drip things are right at the base of the plant that you're trying to grow. Here we have, you know, eggplants and peppers growing. And you can see um, in the very center there where the soil is a little bit darker uh, under those plants, which tells us that that's the area that's being watered. And, you know, drip irrigation, if you have a, a big bed, is the way to go, I would say, on that. The other way is to, um, I like uh, the shower head type nozzles, and that you want to water the soil and not the plant. Um, so if you're hand watering the vegetable bed, you want to put, the, put it so that the water is at the base of the plant and not necessarily on the plant. Um, we can mulch and compost our vegetable gardens to help reduce the uh, weeds in the garden. And you can use a mulch or you can use a compost. I kind of like to use compost to mulch with because um, it's, you know, again, helping to uh, add nutrients, trace elements to the, to the soil. But you can also use, um, you know, just shredded mulch that you would have or a bag of mulch that you would buy from the the garden center and you just put it around the base of the plant. You don't really want the mulch to touch the plant. So you want to leave a little bit of space between the mulch and the base of the plant and use that. Uh, black plastic tends to increase soil temperatures. So if you've got a bed, a new bed, and uh, what you do is you, so you've got your bed and you put the black plastic over the bed and you leave it there, you know, you secure it to the place and you leave it there for a couple of weeks before you plant. And it really does heat up the soil <clears throat> if you wanna do it that way. I personally have never used black plastic, but I know um, in, in the uh, display garden they've used it. And there's also landscape cloth that you can use, but um, I'm not a big fan of those because I just don't think it's very natural. Um, I think organic mulches tend to cool down the soil a little bit. And so you want to not put that on right away if you're getting ready to plant your warm season uh, vegetables because it'll keep the soil too cool. And um, you want to wait till after you've planted and then a couple weeks and then you can kind of put the uh, mulch around. So here's an example of the black plastic and you just, you know, leave it on there. You poke a hole in the plastic and that's where you put your plant. Um, here's another example. You can see here, this is a, a raised bed that's not framed. You can see the pathways in between there. And I actually can't tell what that is, if it's like pine needles or straw, but you can see how the mulch is applied to the growing areas of the bed and you can see how they're leveled, the, you know, the tops of the beds, the tops of the raised area are level and that's where you uh, put the plants. Jenny talked about um, cover crops and this is a green mulch. I think this is like an oak leaf lettuce that you can really grow um, a lot of that in the wintertime if you put a cover over it, but there, um, a lot of the cover crops are, in the pea family uh, because peas um, fix nitrogen in the soil. Nitrogen moves very quickly in the soil. It doesn't stick around like a lot of the other um, elements do. And so, you know, the thing is, is that you, so you grow um, like a vetch or something like that as a cover crop. And then in the spring, you, you, you sow that in the late fall or winter, and then in the spring, you can either mow it um, down or churn it in. But you want to do that a couple weeks before you plant uh, so that it can start to decompose and add to the um, nutritional value of the soil. 
I don't think I gave you a link to cover crops, but if you email me, I will send you a link for that. And then pests, uh, these are not the kids. Uh, these are weeds, insects, animals, and diseases. And so with pest control, you always wanna know what you have before you treat it. What are those brown spots in my lawn? You know, it could be the dog. It could be, you know, more likely the dog than it could be maybe some other uh, insect that you might be worried about. So you always want to know what you have before you treat it. It saves you money and it keeps you from putting something in the environment that you might not need. So, you know, should I or shouldn't I? Is the insect beneficial? How serious is the problem? Is it going to kill the plant? Um, what does the pest feed on? Is the plant young and well established? Uh, like for flea beetles on eggplants. So if you've got, you know, if the eggplant is pretty mature, then the flea beetles are not going to be as damaging as, um, you know, the plants being really young. And you also want to keep in mind, you know, the time that it takes and the money it takes to control. So to me, this is a good example. Is this a good bug or a bad bug? The caterpillar is, you know, it's a caterpillar and it's gonna be a, a moth or a butterfly. But it likes to eat tomatoes. Uh, this is a tomato horn room. And the little rice things that you see on the back of the caterpillar are a parasitic wasp. And those are considered good bugs. And, um, you know, because they uh, hatch and then they sort of eat the caterpillar from the inside out. And then the wasps come out and, you know, they kill bad bugs. That's the issue here. So if you see this on your tomato plant, what do you do? I usually take it off of the tomato plant and put it someplace else in the garden uh, so that I don't kill it. Uh, but I let the wasps do their thing. Um, you know, it's, you have to really make that decision yourself about how much you're gonna to do to control pests in your garden. And a lot of times if we don't do anything, mother nature takes care of it for us because say you've got aphids on a plant, um, you know, then uh, you might get uh, lady beetles the show up uh, that can devour the aphids. Uh, if you don't do anything, you know, sometimes this is one of the ways that gardening teaches us patience. And so, you know, it's really up to each individual person to decide how they want to handle some of these insects. I'm not saying I never kill bugs. I do kill bugs, but, um, you know, I try to be mindful of what the bug is I'm killing and is it doing anything beneficial at all, like uh, being a home for these parasitic wasps. Rabbits can be a problem. Um, rabbits in particular like young plants. Usually once a plant reaches a certain size, the rabbits quit bothering them. So, you know, sometimes you can get rabbit fencing. I've used rabbit fencing around uh, my raised bed, which has, um, you know, if you go to the hardware store and ask for rabbit fencing, the bottom part of it, the grid is different than the top part so that the rabbits can't get in there. Um, deer, hello there. Um, you know, some areas have really bad deer pressure. And if you have bad deer pressure, if you live in sort of a rural or a suburban area, I'm gonna say you probably need a fence around your vegetable garden. Otherwise, the deer will be well fed, but you, you may not be. And then to me, this is like the worst one, <laughs> squirrels, because they can climb fences and get inside your vegetable garden. And they like tomatoes. They don't always take the tomato. A lot of times they just take a bite out of the tomato. Uh, but there are some repellents that you can use. Um, one I kind of liked is called plant skid, P-L-A-N-T-S-K-Y-D-D. -D. It's an organic um, control. It can be granular or liquid, but it works really well on keeping squirrels uh, from where you want them to be. And then chipmunks also, they kind of like tomatoes and they definitely like the bird seed. And um, the plant skid works on chipmunks. It doesn't work on cats though. I have a neighbor who 
lets its cat run and thinks that this one bed I have is its own personal litter box. And you know, that's kind of a pain. So these are some tips on how to control pests. I've given you um, a link to Purdue that has integrated pest management tips. Uh, like when we looked at the tomato hornworm, you know, that's big enough that you can see and you can hand pick those off. You can also, you know, hand pick squash bugs and other things off of the plant. You just kind of need to walk the yard every day or so and look at the plants. Look underneath the leaves of the plants to see if there's anything hiding under there. Um, but you know, it's there are lots of products on the market that will help you control pests. But I think I can buy that kind of a tomato at the grocery store that's been treated with a pesticide. But I know the one in my garden is not treated with a pesticide. So that's one of the reasons we grow our own food is we know what's being used on the food and how it's being treated. So there, you know, it, integrated pest management is the way to go on that. Um, you can see uh, there are some su suggestions here. And again, like I said, the one at Purdue the link for Purdue really gives some good information on that. At the bottom of your handout, you're going to see information about tools and equipment that you might buy. Um, I would suggest that if you buy a shovel or a spade, that you buy the best one you can. Um, I, I have a construction type uh, shovel uh, and really you wouldn't know this but the picture there is actually a spade uh, and a shovel has the pointed end on it which to me looks like a spade if you're thinking about cards but we didn't name these things and i wanted to just let you know that there are uh, tools out there if you have you know small properties so this is a collapsible wheelbarrow the name of it is wheel easy i think and um, you know it collapses and wheelbarrows are large and if you uh, you know have you have a small yard or you don't have space in your garage then maybe you know one of these tools would be better for that we talked about all the information that seed packets have and you can see you know the plant on the front side of it and then on the back side it tells you how to plant, it tells you to plant indoors or outdoors. And then a lot of times it'll give you recipes or things that you can use to, you know, you know how you would use the food that you're, that you're growing. Direct sowing, we talked about, you know, creating the smooth seed bed. We don't wanna walk on the bed. We follow the directions on the seed packet. You sow your seed. Um, you tamp it down, you water lightly, because most seed needs some moisture to germinate. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can put a little bit of mulch over it to help with germination also. But again, um, the seed packet should tell you how long it will take to, for the seed to germinate. Um, transplants, to me, for a lot of beginners are the way to go. Uh, this sort of gives you the nitty gritty on that. It's always nice to plant late in the day or early evening or on a cloudy day or on, right before a rain. It's not always good to plant in full blaring hot sun because it can really stress the plants. And for the most part, um, you don't want to plant the transplant any deeper than it was growing in the little plastic pot. And yes, you take the plastic off of it before you plant it. Uh, but tomatoes can be planted deeper than that. They can be planted pretty much just all the way down to where the, just the top leaves are showing. And one of the ways I plant tomatoes is I plant them horizontally. So, you know, I dig a trench about three or four inches deep. I put the tomato in there and the top of the, and then I cover it all up. And then the top few leaves are what show. And then after a day or two, they're, they're, they're very upright and growing. And one of the reasons you do that is all along the, the horizontal part of the tomato is where the roots grow. Here in Indianapolis, uh, we have some concern about lead contamination. So if you're in an urban area, usually inside 
465 um, in an older home, you want to be mindful that there could be lead contamination. And if you're concerned about that, um, you, there's, um, you can get your soil tested through the, I think it's the State Department of Health. And I, I think I forgot to put the link on that, but if you email me, I can give you the link for that. Also, there was a professor at IUPUI who was doing a lot of study on this. But this is one of the ways that a raised bed can help you have a garden. So if you're, you know, really not sure, then, um, you know, a raised bed might be the way to go. We talk about food safety and probably a few things to remember is you want to use, um, you know, water from the water supply that we have, which is treated. Um, we don't really want to you know, some people use what they call gray water, which is like from the dishwasher or, or I mean from washing the dishes or tub water or something like that. And I would not put that on food crops if it was me. It would be helpful if you can learn a little bit about your the site where you're growing. Just again, because uh, it would tell you about lead contamination. Um, you don't want to put the compost bin so that if it rains, all of the water that's coming out of the compost bin, you know, slurps down into the uh, garden because um, it just uh, could contaminate the garden. You want to make sure that the compost is away from the garden so that if you're using things in there like, um, you know, composted manure and things like that, uh, you want to make sure that uh, the compost gets really, really hot. It tells you here 130 degrees for five days. And then we look at uh, animal contamination. So you don't want your dogs or your cats defecating, you know, in your vegetable garden. And we definitely don't want the neighbors doing that either. So a lot of times a fence uh, may help with that. Uh, the best part is the harvest. So most of the time, what we grow can be harvested several times. How long it takes for a crop to ripen sort of depends on the vegetable. Um, and, you know, some you can pick green, so you can pick green tomatoes. You know, they made a movie on a fried green tomatoes. So we know we can eat those. But some plants really need to be fully mature before we can harvest them. And those are primarily in the squash, you know, pumpkins, watermelon, squash, um, though even the winter squash. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure that those are right before we, we pick them. We always want to be careful uh, handling our food when we're picking it. We don't want to bruise it because, you know, that just opens up uh, that piece of uh, produce for insect or other kinds of damage. You know, you want to be fairly clean with how you're doing it. You want to harvest with clean hands or use, you know, one-time gloves. You want to put them in a clean uh, container of some kind to move them into the house and to use. Um, this is an example of, you know, you, you know, how you can do some of your harvesting. And you always want to wash your fruit right before you eat it. You don't want to wash it as soon as you bring it in from the garden unless you're fixing it for dinner that night but you know just let it stay with in its own dirty self and then when you're ready to prepare it that's when you wash it um, you always want to try to make sure that you're you know you can be as clean as possible so that we're not contaminating what it is that we're harvesting and then we always want to make sure that we wash our produce again before we eat it and here we are with uh, resources here. Here I am. You can see uh, my email there. And um, I think that's. Well, we do have a couple questions that we can go through. Um, we could also, uh, in the interest of time, we could probably send out some of those answers. And I will make sure that we mail the um, resources out to you guys. Um, so just keep communication with me about whether you receive um, I'll probably separate off the resources into a separate document just to make sure that everybody receives that. Um, as far as questions, um, we can we take question. them. Yeah. You want me to go ahead? Yeah. Um, she said, should I put my leaves on my garden in the fall? Yes. 
And then would coffee grounds especially, collected? Especially if they're chopped leaves. Okay. Um, full leaves, um, you know, might get matted down and they won't decompose as quickly to work those um, nutrients down in the soil. But I'm known as a leaf thief. I know who in my neighborhood actually has, uh, collects their leaves with a, you know, a shredder. And you know, I go around and I kind of pick up the plastic bags and see how light they are. And those are the leaves that I the bags that I put in my car and bring to my house and pour those on my vegetable garden. The next question was, would coffee grounds collected from Starbucks be good to help loosen garden soil? You can always work those in the soil or put them in the compost pile. It's not going to change the acidity of the soil though. Uh, they also asked, what about planting by the moon signs? Well, I know that's a traditional thing. I don't have an answer to that. I mean, I know that some people, you know, swear by that, but I've really not done any research on that or done that. What's a better source for transplants than my local hardware stores? I'm not aware of local greenhouses that sell transplants. Well, any of your garden centers will have transplants. I don't know where you are, but, um, you know, like on the south side, you know, courtyard, um, has transplants. Damon's has transplants. I'm sure there are others um, down on the south side. I mean, at the garden center where I work, we have, you know, table after table after table of transplants. So they might not, the warm vegetable transplants don't come in usually until, you know, right before planting time. They may have them there in April, but they may have a sign that says, it's your risk to plant them before May 10th, which is sort of the, when we think we can plant uh, warm season crops is around Mother's Day. But almost all of your garden centers um, would have transplants. And if you're worried about, um, you know, um, things being sprayed on the plants, almost all of the vegetable growers that the like the wholesalers who you know bring you know the garden center brings in the transplants from michigan or illinois or wherever there are there are very few of them if any of them are treated with any uh insecticides or pesticides so if you have an organic garden and you're buying this plant at the garden center and it doesn't say it's in an organic um you know soil i don't worry about that it's going into my organic bed and you know, that's, that's fine. And then the last two questions was asking about the soaker hose, if that's effective. And then the next one was whether it's worthwhile to buy ladybug attractant. Um, the soaker hose is a good idea uh, because it, you know, it, again, it's putting the water at the base of the plant or in the ground where it's actually, where the plant actually needs it. Um, the ladybug attractants, um, you know, I, I've not ever done that, but what I've read about that is it's hard to keep them in your garden. You know, they're, I think you can treat your garden, you know, you can like spray sugar water or things like that on your plants and release the ladybugs, uh, you know, like that. But, you know, there's no guarantee that that ladybug's going to stay in your garden and not move to the next garden. So, <laughs> you know, I don't have any experience um, with using attractants. Okay, great. So our next classes that will be coming up, April 6th is going to be Veggies 101 and 102. April 20th will be Grow Up, talking about structures. May 4th will be Pollinators in the Landscape. Um, we will have event brights for all of those. Each class will have a different Zoom link. You can get information on the Bethany Community Garden uh, Facebook page. So we thank everybody for joining us and we will try to get some information into your hands and uh, Everybody be happy gardening and come join us uh, this spring at Bethany Community Gardens. We'd love to have some additional volunteers. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.